All right. For anybody that doesn't know me, and very few people that don't know me in ADF, I'm Skip Ellison. I joined ADF in 1990, and from 92 until 2010, they served on the Mother Grove. I was in almost every position there was. And I got out in 2010 because I served nine years as the arch crew and I was still moving. At some point, I may be <laughs> foolish enough to get back on the Mother Grove as a non officer director, but I, I highly doubt it. <coughs> I've had enough. All right. As you know, feasting and drinking has always been important. After looking at the program, I think I, the second half might interfere or overlap a little bit with. Uh, some of the work in the drunken botanist. We'll see where that is. <laughs> it's a good stuff. All right, so we'll start off by why was and is feasting and drinking important? Well, in the past, people looked to have times to gather where they could have large feasts. Most people, the only time they would have meat is at some kind of large feast. Otherwise, it would all be a vegetable diet and there wasn't a lot of that to go around. Now, uh, it's important to get together with friends and families. And in the olden days, it was important to get together with your tribe to form that close-knit community that many times today we lack. Uh, we can show historically and archaeologically how, when, and why feasts were held. There's really a lot of good information, although Strangely, there's not that many books written about feasting in the ancient world. Uh, one came out two years ago, but that's the only one I've seen recently. Uh, we do know, according to the writings from the Romans, that they would hold feasts for thousands of people. And we see here in this that uh, Linares, of the, uh, one of the Gaulish chieftains, the ruler of the Averni, held a feast that, according to the records, lasted for several days and had tens of thousands in attendance. It said that they had an enclosure built just for the feast that was a mile and a half each way and had it filled with vats with expensive liquor and prepared so great a quantity of food that it was many days everybody had everything they wanted. Now that might seem like a lot, but a few years ago I was watching one of the morning talk shows and they had one of the female mega superstar singers in it. I think it was Celine Dion, but I'm not positive. But the host was talking to her and said he noticed on her schedule that she had a private party coming in. And he wanted to know what her fee was for a private party. And she gave the best response I've ever heard. She said, this private party is a little affair for 10,000 people. If you can afford to hold a party that big, you can afford my fee. So, and she never did tell how much the fee was, of course. Um, uh, moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about the different types of feast. Uh, holidays, uh, celebrations, special occasions, feast on people, feast to honor and worship the ancestors of the dead, and feast to honor the gods and goddesses. And usually the types of food and the ceremonies for each of these different types of feasts feast was different. And we'll go into that a little bit. Uh, you have to remember that in the ancient days, sacrifice and feasting were very interconnected. You wouldn't have a feast unless there was a sacrifice done at the start. That's where the, the meat and the food for it came from. We have a lot of descriptions from Greek and Roman authors about the types of animals that were sacrificed to the gods, the ceremonies that were gone through before they were sacrificed, and then how they would dispose of the carcass, disposing of it by eating it, what portions were given to the gods, what portions were eaten by the people, what order of precedence of the, would the people come up to get. We'll try to go through a lot of those. There's a, an interesting quote from Homer's Odyssey, where Odysseus is talking to Telemarchus, and he says, sacrifice the best of the pigs so that we can eat soup. It's <laughs> the only place it comes from. Today, most of us have gotten out of the idea of killing an animal, a 
and sacrificing before we eat. We're so used to go to the store, we just pick out the best cuts of the meat and take it home and cook it. But we really should try to sacralize it a little bit. I know many of the festivals used to start out, and I saw last night it started out with a prayer before the food. That's a really good idea. You're sacralizing that feasting that you're going to be doing. Um, and remember, it's not just the animal meat that's being sacrificed. The vegetables themselves, the hard work that goes into growing the vegetables, is a sacrifice in itself. So all of that work goes into it. Now, whenever an occasion called for the sacrifice of a large animal, we're talking a sheep, a goat, a pig, a bull, or a horse, the part that usually went to the gods was, the gods portion was the inedible part. In other words, the entrails, the bones, the fat, although a lot of times the fat was saved for the people because it was such a good energy source. And then everything else was cooked for the worshipers. This was normal practice. And you have to remember too that the sacrifice of a large animal wasn't something that was done lightly. The work that goes into raising an animal, like a cow or a horse, is a lot of work. So if you were gonna sacrifice that, you were giving up a lot of your part. Usually it was a bull that was sacrificed and not a cow because the cow was so important for giving young and for cheese and for milk and everything else. But a bull's redundant. So you could take and give up a bull without influencing your livelihood too much. So that's why bulls were sacrificed. In this quote here comes from the 10th century in Denmark, where many of the inhabitants were still pagan, and sacrificing and feasting continued as it had in pagan days, right up to the 10th century. And this is by a Spanish Jew from Cordoba in the town of Hedby in Denmark, where he was observing that among the people, they would all meet to honor their gods, and eat and drink, each man would sacrifice something, and then they'd put the head of the animal up on a pole outside of their house to show how wealthy they were and how they could afford to sacrifice something that valuable. Uh, most of the time we don't do anything like this, although there are some groves that actually do get together, especially some of the groves that have a Norse focus. will come together and will... I'm not going to say they're going to ritually kill the animal in ritual, but the anim animal will have been sacrificed in a humane way before ritual, strictly for that feasting that's going to occur. <coughs> Uh, now, there were a few exceptions where the entire animal was sacrificed. And for the Greeks and the Romans, that was called a Holocaust sacrifice. And for that, they would go through and kill the animal and then burn it up. <coughs> uh, usually, that was a chicken or a small piglet or some other small animal, a rabbit, something like that, that would just be destroyed completely, and that would be the main sacrifice. You'll also see a few instances in the tales of a Holocaust sacrifice being given to the underworld deities, or to the ancestors. We were just talking about when Odin went down into hell, he sacrificed a cock. He gave, threw that cock over the wall into hell, and it was a Holocaust sacrifice. The entire um, chicken was sacrificed. Next were the Feast for the Dead and the Ancestors. It's interesting to see how much information about this passes down, especially from the Greeks and Romans. When the Romans would bury someone, they would have a feast first to give them sustenance on their way to the underworld. And usually in the tombs, they would have a pipe going down into the tomb or into the tomb, and then the people would gather once a year to share their feast again with the underworld, with the, the dead person. And they'd pour drinks down the tube, or they'd crumble up the food and put it down the tube. 
so that they were continually sharing that feast with the dead. This picture here shows the food underneath down in the tomb while they're eating above it. <coughs> feasting for hospitality. And there's many pictures of that. Uh, we know from the Irish, for example, there's records of when the king would go on journey around the country. And <coughs> how many people he could take with them and what had to be fed to the king and all his people at each stop he'd go on. And there's, from the records, you can see that for many of the nobles, having the king come would be a very big sacrifice. If it happened late in the fall before winter started, your whole town might starve. But you really needed, to, uh, in those days, you didn't want the king to overstay his welcome. So he wanted to make sure that he wasn't there too long and they had him go on to someone else so they could feed him. Now, the fun part of this is what the feast would include. Now, pig was the most prevalent animal that was used. And for all the pictures of the animals, I've tried to go in and find heritage breeds. And especially in the UK, there's a lot of the breeds that go back unchanged from the time when the Irish were walking around on circuit with the kings. We know that the pig was prevalent. We can find that through the archaeological record. In every place, every farmstead, every town, the most prevalent type of bone is pig bone. So, there's a lot of reasons why that. First, pig is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Bacon. It is. Uh, not so much bacon, just was, remember in those days most of the meat or most of the meat wasn't salted to make the bacon. It was used fresh and it was saved, it was dried. So it wouldn't be as bacon. It would be fresh cut hams or not even hams, because hams would be cured too. Mm -hmm. It's the fresh cut meat off the pig. But some of the main reasons are because pigs are very easy to raise. They have big litters. Uh, they'll take care of themselves in the woods. Their usual practice was to, as soon as the pigs were born, let them loose out in the woods. And then in the fall, go out and get them and bring them back and butcher them. <coughs> An easy one to do. Um, we know that pigs figure prominently in mythology. Many of the deities a pig was the favorite food or the favorite sacrifice to them. So that's another reason we know that they're good. This pig is from the Oxfordshire, Oxfordshire, and it's the horse pig. These are the ones that would have been put out in the woods. The next most prevalent food item was cattle. And as I said, usually it was a bull that was sacrificed. Um, and this would be a a bigger sacrifice. The pigs were fairly easy to raise, cattle were a lot harder to raise. The ones here are actually the or are the uh, white park cattle. These are the ones that were referred to as the cattle of the druids. And these are also the, the cattle with the red ear, the white cows with red ears, that were the cattle of the sheep or the fairies. The biggest herd I know of in the United States right now is the Barbie Ranch out in Montana, and they have over a thousand head. Seed Savers in Illinois has another big herd. And every year at the New York State Fair in Syracuse, there are farms in Syracuse that have this type of cattle that they bring in for show. <coughs> I haven't seen any good pictures like that calf up on the top with the red ears, but they have some really nice white ones, and some of their ears are pretty pink. So they are coming back and raising this type of cattle here. Um, as I said, it's usually the bull. The only time a cow would be sacrificed is if it was a worn out old cow, where you know, she wasn't giving milk anymore. She'd already produced all the calves she could. So it, it was time to, to sacrifice her. And that would usually happen in the fall. She'd be one of the herds that was thinned out because they wouldn't make it through the winter. Now, <coughs> See in the records, 
the tarifis, the bull feast, this was used as a method of divination, specifically as a method of divination to foretell the new king. And the way this ritual went through is a bull would be sacrificed, and while the diviner was spending the night wrapped up in the fresh bull hide with the blood still running on the inside, the rest of the community would be having a feast, a sacred feast. And it said that by the next morning, or before he was wrapped up in the thing, he was gorged full on meat, so he couldn't eat anything more. And then wrapped up in the bull hide, the warm, bloody bull hide, they specifically say, and then spent the night there. And in the morning, when he was unwrapped, he would have had a prophetic dream that would tell who the new king was going to be. Being wrapped in a bull hide is a, an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, now, among the Germanic people, we see more cattle bones. I don't know if the cattle, we know the cattle were prevalent on the British Isles, but on mainland Europe, they had larger herds or were more willing to sacrifice more. Um, among the Norse, the bull sacrifices were usually given to Thor and Freyr, and both gods that are associated with strength and with fertility. Next is the horses. Now, to sacrifice a horse, it was a really big thing. It wasn't something done at just a minor festival or if you needed to have the uh, gods on your favor. If a, another tribe was coming to take over your territory and they were going to completely wipe it out, that's big enough to demand a horse sacrifice. But the main horse sacrifice was used during the king-making king ceremonies. Uh, this book uh, listed up here, The Ritual Details of the Horse Sacrifice <coughs> by David Frickett Wilbur. That's Kai Sereth. That's the name he writes under academically. And he's an ADF member that's done a lot of good work on horse sacrifice. Um, according to the record, <coughs> the way the ceremony would go is that the king would start out by having ritual intercourse with a mayor. The mayor would be killed and the flesh would be cut up and put into a large cauldron. And they really don't have a picture of a large cauldron, but that's basically what would happen. After the meat was cooked, the king would get into the cauldron and then eat and drink from the broth. And then after that, he would get back out again and that broth that had the king in and the, the food from the mayor would be dispersed to all the people. This king making was actually part of the, the making, the wedding with the land for the king. The mayor would symbolically be the land and joined with the king and then shared for all of the people in the tribe. And Kai's book goes into a lot of detail on it. And, and his book also brings out the similarities that it wasn't just a, an Irish festival or a ritual that happened. It's also a Vedic ritual that's almost identical to it, with all the parts being the same. Uh, and the reason that the horse would be so special for this is because of the horse's strength and speed and how hard it was to raise a horse. You can get 15 or 20 pigs in a litter every year. For a horse, you're going to get one foal, maybe two foals, every other year. So it's, it's a lot more expensive to raise. The next one is the sheep and goats. You can't really tell a difference from the archaeological rec records between sheep and goat bo bones. They're both identical. And usually there's no DNA, so you can't tell that. <coughs> but we know that they were used a lot. <coughs> um, they probably would have been used after pigs if the people had enough. But sheep and goats are valued for their milk, for their cheese, and for their wool. So it would have been an expensive 
So that's why it isn't used as often as the pigs were. Um, the one up here, the 400 gram, is a really interesting one. It is another one of the ancient breeds. And they have them at the fair every year. They're really cool looking sheep. Uh, this one is from the, uh, uh, this one's from Ireland. Yeah. They also have the Scottish one from the Scottish Hebrides. Um, we also have the goats in Norse mythology. And Ron, you can pronounce that for you because I'm not going to try. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> Tagnesir and Tangnyostr. Tangrisnir and Tangnyostr. Okay. Sure. Approximately. Tooth Nash and Tooth Grinder. Better in mind. <laughs> easier, easier in English. Tooth <laughs> yeah. Nash and uh, Tooth Grinder. Another interesting characteristic that these goats have is they could be killed every night and eaten, and then come back to life the next morning. There's several animals in the tails that have that ability, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then moving on, we come to the chickens, the poultry. Now, we talked earlier about a large chicken. This English game fowl can get up to 20 pounds easily Ooh. as that big, that big a chicken. And for the chickens from the United States, the Rhode Island Red is probably the record holder. We had Rhode Island Red that were this big at least, and they were 20 pounds when we killed them. So they're, they're a good-sized chicken. It's like a turkey. Mm -hmm. They're like a turkey, yes. And wild turkeys, you get wild turkeys many times that are 35 and 40 pounds. So poultry can get pretty big. It's not the usual little 16 pound breast you're gonna get in the store for Thanksgiving. The poultry is interesting. We know that it started out in <coughs> Vietnam area as a jungle fowl and moved up and was domesticated first up into China and then came back from China and came all the way across Europe. So it's a very interesting bird. Some of the, well, we know in the Hallstatt burials in the second century BCE in Austria that they were there. We know in Bohemia in the fourth century BCE there's chicken bones. So it's an old, an old. There's a reference in a 10th century current era, Greek manuscript, about Russian traders going down the Dnieper River to Byzantium. And it talks about how upon reaching St. Gregory's Island, they'd sacrifice a cock in thanks for their hard journey. And it's assumed in this case that they had the chickens with them on the journey to use for eggs and for food. And then it was special enough when they reached St. Gregory's Island that they would give one of the chickens there as a sacrifice. <clears throat> um, and in that case, because it was a chicken or a cock, it was probably given as a Holocaust sacrifice. Um, another time you'll see cocks being given as a sacrifice is to Hecate at Crossroads at midnight. That's the usual sacrifice in that point. Now, along with the poultry, there's also ducks and geese. But until the early Middle Ages, ducks and geese usually weren't domesticated and raised like chickens were. They were usually caught wild. And you know, it was the job of somebody in the village to go out and gather the wild ducks and the wild geese. Middle Ages is when they start seeing the references to the goose girls that would have the geese and go out and herd them around and actually domesticate them. Next, we come to fish. Anybody that's near water in any form is going to have fish and shellfish. It's easy to catch. Uh, and everybody eats it just about. Now, it's interesting, though, that in looking to find the use of fish as sacrifices, there's only one reference I've been able to find where they talk about sacrificing either fish or shellfish to the gods and goddesses. 
and that's in the Atkins and Atkins book, Handbook to Life in Ancient Greece. They say they were given as a sacrifice, but that's the only reference I've ever been able to find. Now, it would be nice to find other references for that. It would be nice to find some archaeological records where it showed this, but I haven't seen it yet. But you never can tell. It might still be out there, and I just haven't found it. One of these days, maybe it will. Now, we know that in northern climates, the people continued through the winter by salting cod. And especially over in Iceland today, you can still get this salted cod, which is a, something that I really don't think I'd like to survive on for a winter. That's mm -hmm. pushing it. It's better than the fermented shark. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, shark? Yes, is better than the one. coral, yes. <laughs> when I uh, <laughs> worked in the the nurses, this, <laughs> this is 30 years ago, um, I had some older clients that were in the upper, upper 80s. Mm -hmm. And they loved that salted cod in the wooden boxes. They loved that stuff. They grew up on it. You yeah. Know? They, I mean, there's a lot of things they ate that were debatable. <laughs> but uh, they, I know this one older woman, they used to make chowder, like a chowder out of it. Mm -hmm. And they, they loved it. They actually liked it. I couldn't stand it. I can see how that one Yeah, no, it's a quarter text, definitely. <laughs> But there's always, you know, anytime anybody is near the sea or near rivers, there's clams and mussels and all kinds of little shellfish that could be used, even during winter. And now we'll go to the next one. Wild game. Now, most times, according to the tales and the archaeological records, wild game wasn't used as a sacrifice for a deity. The reason being that humans didn't have any stake in it. In other words, they didn't spend mm -hmm. the time to raise it, so it couldn't come, it couldn't represent the people to the deities. There's a few differences to that, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But remember too, in well, especially starting in medieval times, the wild areas of the land were the king's province. So the people couldn't come on to that and just hunt for their own food. It was all the king's game, and if you poached from the king's game, you'd probably end up dead. So it wasn't used for feasting that much. Now, we do know in areas where it wasn't um, the king's areas, rabbits and hares have always been around. People domesticated rabbits early and raise them for that. And usually, as I said, there was somebody in the village that would go out and would hunt the ducks and hunt the geese and the swans and owls and all kinds of wild stuff to use as food items. Now, this picture of the wild boar down here, because it is such a, a great animal and we know that they had special, special rituals when they were dealing with wild boars. Wild boars can get pretty big. This photo hasn't been retouched. This is an actual wild boar from one of the game ranches down in Texas. And this one isn't even of the biggest wild boar. The biggest wild boar, there's been a special on Discovery Channel of Hogzilla. <laughs> <laughs> Hogzilla is 12 foot long and weighs over 2,000 pounds. The people that got it buried it before they could be actually scientifically measured and weighed. So they went in and they dug up the grave, and after it had been buried for six months, there was still 1,800 pounds of decaying flesh down in there. And the actual bones were over 10 foot long. Wow. So wow. they figured that, yes, Hogzilla was pretty big. Right down in Texas, when we were down there in uh, June, they were talking that all the fields out there, you can see the wild hogs you know, running through, and they had people that they hire on the farms mm -hmm. to come in with rifles and just kill as many as they can because they destroy all the cops. There's nothing safe from them. So, but in olden days, the wild boar was the special treat. If they were gonna have a, a special gathering of the warriors, they'd try to get a wild boar. Or the kings would go out hunting and try to hunt a wild boar because that was the kingly one. Now, as I said, there was one instance I was able to find where wild game was given as a sacrifice. In, and that was in uh, 
Hilda Davidson's book, Role of the Northern Goddess. She talks about a story that came down from the Gainborns. And she states, in this tale recorded more recently from the Gainborns, two poachers took refuge in a mountain hut in a blizzard and were told by an old woman they met there that they must leave the fat hind for her on a certain cairn on the first Monday of the month. And this suggests a tradition of hunters leaving part of their game as an offering to the guardian of the woods. And it's said that this lasted into the 20th century. Hmm. Now I know a lot of neo-pagan hunters that will do the same thing. They'll, when they kill a deer, for example, they'll do a, a ritual before they go out to hunt. They'll call upon the, the deer to come and sacrifice its spirit so that they can partake of it. And then after they kill it, they'll leave not only the entrails, which is the gods portion, but they'll also take and leave a special part of the meat that they give to the gods and then thanks for that sacrifice. Um, oh, I forgot that about the wild boars. In the wild boars in Scandinavia and Denmark was traditionally part of the Christmas feast. The hunters would all go out before that and kill as many as they could and bring them in for that Christmas feast. Uh, talk about the rabbits. And yeah, as I said, a lot of the other things you're going to see is the, the birds, like the jays and the larks and nightingales, and things you wouldn't normally consider being food animals. But there are tales coming down that they have all kinds of things that you wouldn't think of. Like you wouldn't think of eating storks or cranes because they would be extremely fishy. Uh, you wouldn't think of eating owls, but they were in the records too. And then we go to the, another one is vegetables. Now, we have these pictures of the grain family. <coughs> in Europe, it would be wheat, barley, rye, millet, sorghum, and other wild grains. Even plantain grains and like that were used for different types of breads or porridge that would be made. The picture here on the right is barley, and that would have been cultivated. You'd also find barley growing wild in many places. Then you'd also have the root vegetables, so parsnips and cabbages and asparagus, uh, onions and garlics and radishes. And the picture on the left is a Roman, a Roman mosaic of the fruits from one of the uh, temples in Pompeii, not temples, from one of the houses in Pompeii. And I'm sure that people would also go out and wildcraft any greens they could find. It's anybody that lives in the country knows that you can always go out in the spring and get dandelions, and you can always go out and get wild onions, and they all make good in the salad. And then the last part is the exotics. As I said, some of the feast lists from the Romans list such things as hummingbird tongues, flamingo, <laughs> elephant, all of the big cats, and many other African animals and birds, including the monkeys and primates. <laughs> and we also hear from the Romans that they would breed snails and dormites specifically for the table. I don't know if I want to eat dormice, but it's supposed to be a delicacy in China. My, my, my wife did like once rabbit. make mock dormice for a uh, Roman night. Really? The way a uh, game night group does. And not really, they were done with chicken. They were not actual <laughs> dormice. <laughs> yeah. But, but they were good. Yeah. And it was nicely flavored. It was definitely a different flavor than you expect from modern cuisine, though. Yeah. But still, if you look at those lists, you just think to yourself, how far will some of these people go just to top somebody else? Just to say, I have the most exotic foods at my feast. How do they even catch enough hummingbirds to I serve know. tongues to more than <laughs> one person? You just drove between trees across the migration arc. Oh. Yeah. It still happens today, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 But yeah, some of the, mm -hmm. but the oh. list all, exp you know, the, okay. still extant today. Okay. They go down and show you all the things we're eating there. It's really cool to, to look do some research on this. That's why I'm surprised nobody's gone for a master thesis on feasting, because that would be a really cool book to, to read 
afterwards. Mm. My master's thesis on feasting would be more practical. <laughs> yeah, mine would be a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Next, we want to talk about how it was served. Now, the order was really important. Um, we know from the Irish that there was the, the hero's portion or her champion's portion. And there's other things, too. Um, honor and place was very important in the old days. Just as you'll see it today, there's an order of precedence for people to come into a hall, or the modern days, the rich people will go to the rich restaurants. It's still the same thing where prestige is very important. And it's nothing new. And, you know, back in those days, kings were better than the nobles who owned the land, the nobles were better than the warriors, the warriors were better than the peasants. It goes down from there. They would fight to the death over a thigh. They, they literally <laughs> would. There's stories from the Irish mythology of two people coming up for the chant. There's the two tales right there. Of people coming up and saying that they should be first, and they kill each other until they figured out who was best. Doesn't, doesn't make much, uh, well, <coughs> anyways. Who mm -hmm. um, goes cold? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. The the <laughs> oh, in Hilda Davidson's book, Myth and Symbols and Pig in Europe, she also talks about the uh, Greek writer Athenaeus, who talked about this hero's portion. And he says, in former times when the hind quarters were served up, the bravest hero took the thigh piece, and if another man claimed it, they stood up and fought in single combat to the death. That's where that quote comes from. I mean, I could understand it if it's like the turkey drumstick at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> or, or right yeah, there. but those are good. <laughs> you know, let me have, have that piece. You, you, you get whacked. Uh, that's all that family struggle at Thanksgiving into context, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> my dad always gets the first drumstick. I think that's interesting. Like my family yeah. members Social have. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's prestige. Prestige. Yeah, prestige. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not about what you're fighting over. No. Right. It's, it's about prestige. your place. Right. So next Thanksgiving, you've got to point out that your dad's getting the champion's portion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is how it was served. Let's talk about what was used, though. We've got all kinds of references to cauldrons and fire dogs and a lot of stuff about the implements itself. For the cauldrons in uh, Celtic mythology, we hear about the cauldron of the dog, the, the quirin dog, the, or the quirinsic, the undried. And the, the cauldron of the dog duh, would be that from which every man would draw based or draw sustenance based on his worth, so that no man would be turned away hungry. And the cauldron was supposedly large enough to cook whole oxen in, so it was a big cauldron. Now, people think that that big <coughs> cauldron is just pure mythology, <coughs> but in the British Museum from the Sutton Who find. They have cauldrons that I could easily fit in and lay down and not have my head out. Wow. It was yeah. really cool. They've got a lot of them on display in the Sutton Who Park. In fact, I think the one on the left does come from that, from the British Museum. And the fire dogs are from the British Museum too, I believe. I'm sorry. So there, there's some big things. The idea with the fire dogs is they had fireplaces large enough in the larger halls that you could literally take metal implements like that and take a metal rod and stick it all the way through a pig and roast a whole pig in the fireplace. Then we get to the utensils that were used. Now, some of these forks, you really can't read the writing on it too much. The one on the left is a medieval fork. And you have to remember that forks like this really weren't used all the time. Most of the implements that were used up until, uh, say, 5th or 6th century current era, was a knife in your hand. Mm -hmm. a, your bowl or plate was a piece of wood that had been sliced, or a loaf of bread that was hollowed out. 
so the entire thing was eaten. They didn't have place settings like we think of now, up until at least Middle Ages. The ones on the right are revolutionary period. The ones on the left were earlier than that. They were like 11 to 1200. But the main thing was just the person's small line. Everybody would have a table. So let's talk a little bit about when the feast were in. Talked about the feast for the ancestors. Uh, this is the feast that times for the ritual feast for the or for the um, gods and goddesses. We know the Celts had the four fire festivals. Uh, one thing before I talk about them individually, remember too that in olden days it wasn't so much a calendar date; it was the time of the year. We talked earlier about the Hawthorne Bloom for Celts. Yeah, how it came about. People knew from the land around them when it was time to harvest. You know, when it was time when winter was going to be there and it was time for the final harvest. It was what the land was telling them, not what a, a date set on the calendar. Um, for the Celts, the four fire festivals have been brought forth into the Neo Pagan calendar, and that's in both Beltane, Lunasa, and Solomon. ADF groves celebrate those under different names sometimes, at least those. And then it's usually the cross border days, which are the equinoxes and the solstices. All of the cultures had some form of things going on on the uh, equinoxes and solstices. People like to say there's no historic record for them, but when you actually dig into it, yeah, there is. And where you find those records are in the folk customs for planting and sowing and stuff like that. And they're all dealing with the same time of years. So the customs are there. They're just not as as height as the fire festivals. Um, I don't have to go through the festivals. I know everybody here probably knows that. Yeah, with the Norse, we see in the Norse that there were mainly the three uh, winter's night, and winter's night was supposed to be three, four, or maybe a four-day festival. In Iceland, winter's night is recorded as lasting from October 11th to October the 18th, an eight-day festival. Uh, summer's beginning was in April, and that was uh, summer mail, and that was from April 9th to April 15th, and this was the time when the men would go biking. And then they had Yule in midwinter, and um, that's the one that's come down to mostly okay and so right Yule and so forth. Uh, Snorri Sturluson in Linga Saga tells us that in Scandinavia they were just the three main feasts. One at the beginning of winter where men sacrificed for plenty, one in midwinter for the growth of crops, and one in summer for victory. And there might be other times feast took case, but those three main ones were the established pattern over most of Northern Europe. Among the Romans, now well, the Romans had a lot of feast days. Those were good at this. Uh, festivals were time to visit the temples and make sacrifice. It was the time when the people that could afford to make the sacrifice would do that, and then the other people in the area would come in and, and eat well. They did, the Romans did have festivals for private occasions, for birthdays, uh, for prominent citizens. And as they said, on public feasts, though, all work was stopped because you couldn't pollute the sacred day by working, and the large feasts were held. Now, they say that all work was stopped so you wouldn't pollute the feast by ER by working. But who was making the food? Somebody had to do all that. Somebody had to work. <coughs> That's what the slaves were slaves. <laughs> Work, Slave working didn't count for polluting. Uh, yes, it's interesting to remember that the word festival originally meant simply feasting. It's the origin. In 
Handbooks of Life in Ancient Rome, Atkins and Atkins list 123 separate public festivals celebrated in or around Rome. And some of these are only one day, but others lasted up to a week or more. And then we come to the Greeks. The Greeks had even more festivals than the Romans. In Athens, it's been estimated that just under half of the days of the year were festival or feast days. So you don't get a lot done if you can't work in a festival or feast day. But the slaves still did. All right. Now, I did talk about animals that could be eaten multiple times. Uh, one of the first ones we hear about is Mananon McLear of the Tour de Donna had a herd of pigs that could be eaten all the time. It said in the tales that their flesh was the sweetest man would ever know. Odin's boar, Shermnir, close? Shermnir. Shermnir, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and provided the warriors in his hall with a never ending supply of pork. And there's a reference in one of the sagas that states the pigs are boiled every day and come to life each evening. And then we hear about Thor's goats again, and there's a good story where he uh, stopped at a cottage one night, and they went in and they killed the goats and had them for the meals, and the son of the family cracked the bone open to get at the marrow. And then the next day, the goat was limping because the bone was cracked. So Thor wasn't very happy. Um, and then the last one here is St. Patrick's bull. It seems that St. Patrick had a bull that he could take into a town and kill and have the people feast and eat, and then St. Patrick would gather up <coughs> all the bones and the skin and put the, wrap the, the bones up inside the skin and then shake his wand, his staff, over it, and the bull would come back to life. So this is out of the same tale where St. Patrick is going in and contesting with the Druids to show that he was better. So he was showing that he could do anything the Druids could do. All right, so that's all I've got for feasting. Is there anything else anybody would like to add about the feasting side before we get into drinking? You bought liquor? <laughs> <laughs> I did, but it's in my room. <laughs> Nothing personal problem there. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's go into to the drinking. Now, as I stay here, it said that uh, to the Norse, drinking is the act that hallowed the hall. And so it was very important. The book that I talk about there, Lady with a Mead Cup, is one of the best books out there, Michael Enright's book, is mm -hmm. one of the best books out Back there. Back in print again. That describes the uh, customs of drinking and feasting in part. Yeah. For the Indo Europeans. Especially the, the, the social standing. Europeans. Social standing is all in there. It's a great book. For a yeah. long time it was out of print, but now it's back in print and it's mm -hmm. not too bad. It's, and it's really just taking apart Beowulf and looking at the yeah. one ritual within it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 well, that's part of it, but Henry brings in other stuff, too. Yeah, he brings in other stuff, too. Yeah, that's, I think this came out of his course on Beowulf, if I'm right. Well, I thought Lady with the Meat Cup came out of his master's thesis. For some reason, I thought he was out uh, teaching. Could be, yeah. could be both. <laughs> could be, yeah. I'll have to look in the preface for it and see what it says. But it's I've been a while since I read that. Where it was. Um... One of the things this book is about, and when talking about the horse drinking, is the symbols. Always try to make sure that people understand that for the Norse, a symbol was not to get drunk at. If you got drunk at a symbol, you were dishonoring the gods, and you could be killed. It's hard to explain that to people today because, oh, you're going, to, that's a drinking part. <laughs> it's not a drinking part. You don't want to get drunk. And if, let me, let me see how I can put this politely. If you are the type that get drunk easy, make sure you take just tiny little sips. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stand there and, some people will say that you can't set your horn down empty. 
or you can't set your horn down with anything in it. That's not really the case. You don't have to drain it every time. Be careful about that. Especially if you've got a horn like Flip's. <laughs> Flip Rutledge is... Uh, it holds two bottles of mead easily. We have to eat two bottles of mead. It's that long. Well, Jimmy Smith is... <coughs> We've got two ourselves that yeah. hold gallon and a half, two gallons. Yeah, you don't want to drain those. Um. And whatever you say over the horn is sacred. So whatever you, you say over, over the horn is sacred. So you better mean what you say. Exactly. And in fact, look, we're talking about horns. There's some pictures of the horns. These are again from the British Museum. They have, in fact, the one in the middle bottom might be one of the oryx horns. It, it could be. Some of them are really big. Uh, the one description where he's talking about Beowulf and what happens when uh, Hrothgar's queen, Wilthrow, comes out and carries it around is really interesting just to read the description to see how much it says in there. It says, Wilthrow came forth, Hrothgar's queen, mindful of customs, gold adorned, greeted the men in the hall. And the noble woman offered the cup first to the keeper of the land of the East Danes, bid him be glad at the beer drinking, beloved of the people. In joy he partook of the feast and hall cup, king famous for his victories. Then the woman of the helming went about to each one of the retainers, young and old, offered them the costly cup, until the time came that she brought the mead bowl to Beowulf. She, the ring-adored queen, mature of mind. Sure of speech, she greeted the man at the gate. Thank God that here wish was fulfilled, that she might trust in some man for help against deadly deeds. So if you look at this, then they all went out on a whole long speech and vowed to help, the, the, the help win the battles coming up. But you see several things. First, it's talking about beer drinking and it refers to the cup as the mead bowls in one spot. So maybe they had both beer and mead, entirely possible. It also refers to the costly cup and shows that the ceremony was one that was done again for prestige and for pride. And it was to impress the people with the wealth of the king. And finally, the order is very important. As we said with the food and the hero's champion, you go to the most important person first, and then come down in order, and then finish it back up with the king to tie everything together, to show the beginning and the end with the two prestigious people. Um, you know, these horns, there's, the British Museum has literally hundreds of examples of it and on display of all the really cool vessels and the ewers and wine pitchers and tons of cool stuff. Uh, in Hoshgart in Austria, there's a chieftain's grave from the 6th century BCE. And on the wall of the chamber were nine elaborate drinking horns, and in the chamber was a cauldron from Greece that held the remains of meads. And it was cool because they could actually get the, the exact recipe for the mead from what was left in that cauldron. Mm -hmm. um, in the book Gaelic War by Caesar, he describes how the men of the Germanic tribes prized the horns of the oryx. The, and, and my, when I originally did this, I said an ex extinct species of cattle. Now, <laughs> last year, they reintroduced the oryx into one area in Germany. They've been backbreeding instead of trying to use genetic manipulation or anything from Jurassic Park. They've been backbreeding <coughs> the cattle that had the highest level of oryx genes in them nice. and had produced actual oryx again. And they were about 95% oryx. Wow. So they've reintroduced a herd and it's running wild in Germany. Cool. So it's going to be cool to see what comes from that. Uh, one of the Irish tales, it said that Finn McCumal had 312 gold drinking horns and that he had names for each one of them and that each of them could hold enormous amounts of liquor, in other words, large ones. Sutton Who, another thing for the burial. There was a lot of drinking horns there, as well as a lot of cauldrons. The largest cauldron is from Sutton Who had a capacity of 100 liters. So that's a, a lot of liquid. 
Uh, we also see that in uh, Odin's Hall, he always has the shield maidens going around with horns to each of the warriors and giving them of the Valkyries. All right. But horns were used a lot. And nowadays you can find horns at all the large festivals and find them online. And a lot of people do horns nowadays. <coughs> you can even get horns that you can use as coffee mugs. Or you can use a coffee mug. But uh, you get horns to <coughs> act as coffee mugs. Oh, yes. They're not that you can use horns though. as coffee mugs, yes. The kind that has the stand built into it so you can sit it down. Yeah. 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 We want that from Norway with a, yeah. a nice striking yeah, stand. Mm -hmm. yeah, pretty cool nowadays. Horns are big. <laughs> and then we talked about the cauldrons. Some of the cauldrons are really nice. There's uh, several tales from the Celts about the inexhaustible cauldrons of me from the other world. And two of the tales are found in is The Wasting Sickness of Cahoolan and The Adventures of Art. We also hear from the, not you, but close. We also hear from the Norse that Odin had an inexhaustible supply of mead in his hall. Mm -hmm. And it said now from no, Odin that the mead came from the udders of Hedrin, the goat that fell on, or fed on the world tree. And then there's its tale from The Life of St. Columbus from the seventh century current era, which talks about Columbus coming up to a group of men that were clustered around a large cauldron. And it was called a cuppa that supposedly held about 20 measures of beer. So from what I could see from translating it back, it's around five or 10 gallons of beer. So the men had told him that the beer had been dedicated to Woden and they had made it specifically for sacrifice. But then the saint approached them said he wouldn't stand beer to be sacrificed to a pagan god and walked up and touched it and when he did the cauldron burst apart and the beer was wasted. So the moral of that is don't let saints get near your beers. <laughs> <laughs> the two pictures here, the, let's see, which is which? Yeah, the one on the left is from the princely grave in Champagne region and the one on the right is a drink uh, drinking cup from Greece. And as I said, in the British Museum, they have hundreds of different kinds of vessels. It can be the ritualized pitchers with spouts on four sides, and all kinds of ewers, and a lot of interesting things. So next, I want to talk about what was drank and how it was prepared. You know, the tales, once again, are a good source. And in addition to the tales, we have a lot of archaeological evidence. As I said, we found that, uh, or they found that the recipe for mead could be brought back from one of those. Several of the recipes for early beer, including going back to Egyptian beer, had been brought back to life. Uh, there, there's a lot of cool things about it. Mm -hmm. And for this last, uh, next to the last picture. Next for the last picture, I thought this was one of the coolest bottles I'd seen, so I had to put this in here. And the name of the company is actually Make Mead Like a Viking. Nice. Cool. Uh, I didn't get a chance to try it here, or the meat, but I would like to. It's gotten nowadays, though, to the point where you can walk into even small liquor store and find meats. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool. But for a long time, that couldn't happen. You had to wait for Griffin to come from Illinois or somebody special that made the good meats. I'm waiting to be able to order it at a bar. Um, you can get ciders now, so, yeah. so yeah. meats may yeah. make cool. Not yet. Not yet. Somebody was telling me they had mead. It was made. Yeah, um, it was made by the monks. The place where monks mead comes from, yeah. which is down in the Finger Lakes. Okay. And they were saying one of the bars. I don't know if it was in Syracuse or Ithaca. I had it. Probably Ithaca. Might have been Ithaca. Probably Ithaca. All right. So, anyways, I think most people are familiar with how mead is made. Correct. I know. Mead's just a simple drink. It's honey and water, and then add something for flavoring. You know, some you kind want. of yeast needs to be in there to start the fermentation. I guess. But you can just leave it out, and enough yeast will come out of the air usually to have it ferment. Yeah, but you may not want to drink that one. <laughs> well, you never can tell what's going to come in out of the air. Yes. Uh, there's two stories that came about from the Norse on how mead was first formed. The story tells us that the mead of poetry, when the Aesir and the Vanyar had finished their warring, 
and they called a truce, they prepared a spell in a large festival, and then to pledge their agreement, each person spit into the vestal. And from that spell came the man, Vespar, who was all knowledge, and he was killed by the dwarfs, and then his blood was transformed into the first man. The next part also tells us how the, the dwarfs had got in trouble with the giants, the giants took the bead that was made from his blood, and then the Odin came and traveled to the land of the giants to steal the mead back. So by this time he had gone, uh, the mead was hidden away in a mountain. He transformed into a snake, crawled into the mountain, drank all the mead, got back out, transformed to an eagle, got back to Valhalla, <coughs> spit the mead out, and that's how the mead came back to the gods. <laughs> Um, <laughs> skipping a lot of stuff in between, but yes. Yeah, well, that's, you know, we only don't have so much time here. And then the second place that it came from, as I said, was from the goats of uh, Hedron in Odin's Hall, from the others. Next, we can talk a little bit about air and beer. Uh, again, another subject that people here know a lot about. Uh, one of the stories I've seen from the British Isles is there's a place in the British Isles called Butzer Antique Farm. And what it is is they go in and they're trying to recreate completely the life of the Celts from 300, 500 BC. And they have grad students that work there and they do everything they can to do things the same way. So one of the ways that the Celts would store grain is they ship pits down in the chalk. And then they put the, the grain down in there and put a cover of chalk back on it. And it was sealed tight enough, usually, that water wouldn't get into it. Well, one of the pits developed a leak and the water got down in with the grain, into, in the, the barley, in this case, I believe it was. And the next year when the students came back to check it, that watered barley had fermented. So that was very likely how some of the early beers came about. Mm -hmm. and, and they said that, you know, most of the researchers were grad students, so I'm sure none of the beer went to waste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they did say it was sour tasting, though. But it did have an alcohol content. That makes sense. Still had to taste better than some of the things that college students were uh -huh. Well, that could very well be, yes. <laughs> Uh, and last, I want to talk about wine. Uh, wine spread from the um, Italy area through most of the Mediterranean. Wine was a very good source. It said in the British Isles that the tribes would trade a cask of wine for a slave. Hmm. So that was pretty good. So that would place wow. the value of the cask of wine above that of a cow. Expensive. In 1953 in Vix, they found another tomb of a princess from the Iron Age Celts, and that was in there was the largest surviving vessel for wine. And this crater, it was made of bronze and used for mixing water and wine. I know sacrilegious, but it, that's how the Greeks did it. I know. It stands five feet tall and weighs almost 450 pounds. It was designed to hold almost 250 gallons of wine. Wow. So it would probably have been made in one of the Greek colonies and brought in to modern day France that way. Well, that's not really that large when you compare it to the you know, standard cask One for barrels. aging wines nowadays. The old no, cask. nowadays, yeah. Yeah, nowadays you look at the ones in the brewery, or not the breweries, but the wineries, and it's you'll see ones that people are dwarfed by. <clears throat> yeah, but I think the standard. Uh, you know, fermentation or aging cask for red wines is somewhere in 200 gallon size. Yeah, pretty big. Uh, again, I'm going to finish this off a little early, but to finish this off, we'll go to toasting. Now, it's interesting that we do have toast recorded from both pagan times and Christian times. And here is a, just a couple of them. Uh, the first is from pagan times. It was given by Jarl, Jarl Sigurd in the town of Leid in Denmark. And as he said, he drank first to Odin for power and victory, then to Njorn and Freyr for peace and good seasons, and the last to the memory of the dead ancestors. This follows the style that's used in many of the ADS 
symbols. I'm say it sounds like a symbol to me. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. where you drink to the gods, and then you drink to the spirits of the nature and the stuff around you, and then last to the ancestors. And a very similar one on the right comes from Christian times, and it was given at the funeral of Harold of Denmark. And to Christ, to St. Michael, and to the memory of the dead king. Again, the same thing. They're speaking to a gods and a demigod, and then to the memory of the king for the ancestors. Uh, oh, there's one more interesting one. There's a record of the men making a toast on the body of a boar before it's consumed. It's found in the Rivera saga, and the tales tell how before the toast was made, the boar had been offered to Frere, and so would be the conduit for their words to the gods. So that's basically all I have on the consumption. And do we have anything more on questions or anything to deal with drinking other than what's going to be happening tonight? <laughs> <laughs> and I say that with a certainty that usually at festivals, drinking happens. Yes. <laughs> Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> I did bring some of that. Tasty, tasty heresy. heresy. Yes. Well, was there, talking about the say something up there? talking about the uh, Greeks watering their wines. Yes. Uh, heresy. So, some <coughs> well, of what I've heard, I don't have any sources to back it up. Is the old Greek wines were actually rather thick, like mm -hmm. thick like blood. So watering the wines actually made them drinkable. Probably rather like a like a good balsamic vinegar where it turns syrupy. Yeah. Yeah, where, where most of the water is evaporated out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So watering would make sense in that respect. Like well, a big cordial, like ice wine. Really but. <laughs> but also, but also. The heathens to the north. <laughs> but also, the, 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 whole, the whole idea of watering it was so that you didn't get sloshed. You know, right. you, you were drinking it as your main beverage, like all the time. So right. you didn't want to be walking around completely drunk all the time. So like, what, what did they say? Why? Why did the Puritans land at Plymouth Rock? Plymouth Rock, because they ran out of beer. They had the short they had beer, which was in. basically they had casks of mildly alcoholic beer, which was their water supply. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. because it was all safe to drink. Mm -hmm. But you also have to realize the uh, complaint about the barbarians to the north not watering their wine was also propaganda. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. Like what heathens are they? They don't put water in there. And, it, and it's worth noting that you know it has cropped up that it's the claim that. Uh, Alcohol used to be like beers and wines were much less strong, you know, way back when. And mm -hmm. yeah. There's been a lot of research, and it looks like in medieval times they tended to go a bit lighter, but the ancients did know how to go and brew as well as we do. Yeah, yeah. It, it's possible, but it's being a, uh, probably not likely that you were seeing much above 5%. <laughs> uh, we have had to work extremely hard in the past 10 years or so to get yeast that can do 25%. Okay. Yes. Yeah. For yeah, but comparable to you know wines and beers is commonly known before right. you know before Utopias came out <clears throat> and Sammy Claus and some of the other uh, winter uh, beers. The thing I find interesting nowadays is you're seeing more and more hard soda. Yes, yep. hard yeah. pop. Which is just a lot of people that don't you know they don't tend to like, like beer. That, that I've gotten to the point where I like cider better than than beer. Or people who have celiac disease and can't eat and can't drink things with wheat. Yep. The uh, fusion of ciders has been wonderful for that. Oh, they were huge. Yeah. So I don't think alcohol and soda is really something. And the other thing, now you're seeing the hard apple cider. What? Yeah, yeah, I, I yep. like and that. that. You know, basically, people used to make apple juice. They, they had the apple, apple cider Shandy outside and, and let it freeze, and, and the alcohol <laughs> content would raise up. Oh, that's the official way to make ice pop, too. Mm -hmm. You make the pot, let it freeze, remove the ice. <laughs> You take half the water out of it, now it's... Well, that's why ice wine was so concentrated, because they let the grapes freeze, right. and most of the water is discarded with skins. Yeah. yeah. But they can only do that in the first frost. Yes. Or they, there's some um, vineyards that cheat and pick the grapes and throw them in the freezer. Yeah. It's not quite the same. Yeah, the but there's the reason why it's quite twice the price for half the volume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's good. But it's so good. <laughs> oh, it's so good. All right, still then, thank you very much.